Okay, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. Welcome to the 218th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, the latest in our regular monthly meetings. You're welcome. Tonight we have David Reveman and Zach Reisner, who will be giving us a talk called Crostini, or Crostini, there's, there's going to be some confusion there, uh, Running Linux Applications on Chrome OS. Um, First off, I'd like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, for continuing to provide this lovely space, and thank you to everyone here for taking the opportunity to join us tonight. Uh, Two Sigma is hiring. Uh, you can speak to the folks in the back there if you're on the market. Uh, they're looking for Linux systems engineers. That's Kyle in the red, uh, and Makoto in the, uh, I don't know what that is. Uh, <laughs> it's a cool shirt, though. Um, Tonight, we, before we get started, we'll have our usual requests. Uh, please silence your phones. Um, do not eat any snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. Um, as usual, we'll be recording tonight's meeting uh, and posting it on our YouTube channel within a few weeks. Uh, we'll put the link in the meetup.com meeting comments when it's ready. Uh, so please use the mics for questions uh, so you can be heard in the recording. We'd like to take a moment to thank all our sponsors, past and present, including Two Sigma, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, the Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. Workshops. Please talk to Seema or Hana. Hana's in the back there. Uh, afterwards, if you'd like to know more about our workshops, Hana's also always looking for volunteers. Um, they're happening at the NYU Silver Building for now still, room 512, 32 Waverly Place. The next workshop will be Tuesday, August 7th from 7 to 9 p.m. It will be on the Nylog Meetup page shortly. Um, the next general meeting will be in September, so don't come here in August. Uh, September 19th, uh, speaker and talk TBA to be announced. Keep an eye up on, a, on our Meetup page for that. After the presentation, we'll be heading to the Cupping Room Cafe to continue the conversation. 359 West Broadway. Follow any of us on the way there. It's pretty close by. Final reminders. Silence your phones. Put away loud wrappers. Use mics for questions at the end. Okay, on to the talk. David Revman worked on bringing compositing to the Linux desktop 10 years ago when he was at Novell. Uh, in the last seven years, David has worked at Google, bringing the Chrome compositor building the Chrome compositor, I should say, bringing Android apps to Chrome OS with native graphics performance, and most recently, bringing Linux applications to Chromebooks. Uh, Zach Reisner has been working on Chrome OS platform for four years with a focus on graphics. Recently, Zach has been working on CrossVM. CrossVM? Cross I don't know. VM. We're not sure. Okay. Uh, the new virtual machine monitor powering uh, Crostini, or Crostini, uh, and Vertio Wayland. I didn't even ask him how that one was pronounced, so that's going to be Vertio Wayland? Uh, sure. It's good. Uh, <laughs> the transport protocol underlying the windowing integration. Currently, Zach is working on bringing GPU acceleration to applications running under Crostini and advancing Rust usage throughout the Chrome OS. Now, please welcome David and Zach giving us Crostini, running Linux and applications on Chrome OS. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is David, this is Zach, uh, yeah, uh, we've been working on Chrome and Chrome S projects for some time, and uh, most recently we've been working on the Crostini project, and uh, in this presentation we're uh, hoping to give you a little more insight into how Crostini works, and uh, also some details on how you can use it. Sounds good. Let's see if this works. There we go. Uh, so this is the uh, outline of our talk. We're going to start with uh, a little bit of history uh, about the project. Then we're going to tell you about the virtual machine monitor we built. Uh, after that, we will tell you about how we use containers. Uh, then some details about how the UI integration works, followed by launch launcher integration and files integration. Then uh, we'll provide some instructions for how you can use this today. Um, finishing with uh, some limitations and things you can do as a Linux application developer to make your applications 
work better on Chromebooks. Um, so before I let Zach tell you about the uh, more recent history, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit more background information. Uh, we Traditionally, Chrome OS was just Chrome the browser and the web. We didn't have Android applications or Linux applications. Uh, we had a limited support for Linux applications through a, a product called uh, Crouton. And, uh, but one big downside with Crouton was that you had to ter um, put the device in dev mode, which meant that all the good security benefits of Chrome OS were lost. So, you know, it was never considered a, a, like a real solution or a real product. But, you know, if you wanted limited support for Linux applications, maybe you, don't, you didn't need really good UI integration, uh, and you didn't care about security as much, then you could do that on a Chromebook. Uh, but a couple of years ago, we started another product called Arc++. Arc++ brings Android applications to Chromebooks uh, with good UI integration. And to do that, we had to, we had to uh, create a channel of communication between Android and potentially untrusted applications and uh, Chrome. Uh, for, for that, we decided to use the Wayland protocol as the interface of communication. And uh, that is what allows Android applications to integrate really well with Chrome. So now we had uh, a system where we could have these external applications uh, run and integrate with the UI. And we had Crouton that allowed you to run Linux applications. And this allowed us to create some early prototypes. Uh, even in the early days of R++, we could, uh, for example, get Android Studio running for doing development and, and uh, a number of different Linux applications. Uh, so it made for a great demo and a great prototype. But of course, it was not something we could really make a real product out of because it was not secure. Uh, but it, you know, it left us thinking about how could we eventually uh, turn this into a real thing. We didn't know exactly what would be needed to do that. We just knew that um, we needed a fancier, more secure version of Crouton, essentially. Uh, yeah, so kind of continuing along what Reven was saying. Um, so we started to think about how this was going to be turned into a real product. We have kind of the puzzle pieces there. We've got this Wayland integration. We've got containers, which kind of get us close to the right security story, but we really want to make it sort of airtight. You know, something that we would really be uh, think think would live up to the Chrome OS security name. Um, so we kind of thought, well, what if we sort of lock down exactly what applications could run in the container to be just sort of applications we thought we could secure well enough. Um, a good example of such an application we wanted to run on Chromebooks we were thinking was Android Studio. Um, but you know, coming down and thinking about it, we realized that you know, if you have a sufficiently complex enough application, you could inevitably use that to try to run code, and try to hit kernel interfaces if you have access to them. You know, an example would be using the debugger in Android Studio um, to try to sort of dig at the kernel. And we really didn't want to expose that. In, in Chrome OS, uh, applications or untrusted applications don't have direct access to the kernel. Um, so we realized that if we wanted to give them both these very, uh, you know, th things like IDs, uh, as well as allowing them to use untrusted code, we had to do it inside of a VM. Uh, I, and continue to think about it, well, we had to actually pick what virtual machine monitor we're going to use. Uh, you know, a very common option is QEMU or, or things like VirtualBox. You know, were these going to fit for the product? We had to think about this, and we actually went through several iterations. Additionally, we wanted people to be able to run the kinds of apps that they wanted to, so the question is, how are they going to get them? It wasn't at all obvious back when we started. You know, there's tons of options out there, both old and new. Uh, additionally, we had to think about what the product would look like and who it would be targeted at. 
Um, you know, people like uh, developers or gamers or artists or you know, even electrical engineers, who are we going to hit with this product? Um, we've got some conclusions. Uh, yeah, so um, the conclusions from that was we, we needed to build a new virtual machine. Um, we called it CrossVM, um, a virtual machine that was more tailored to our use case. Uh, we decided that containers um, was how we're going to do app distribution uh, that gave users the ability to potentially run whatever they want in their container. We would provide a supported one, but it wouldn't, users wouldn't be locked to that one. And all the containers would have the access to the ex exact same integration points. They can get the same, uh, same nice UI integration as our supported container. <laughs> And uh, we would target developers. That would be uh, easier to start with. Uh, by, if, by targeting developers, we knew that if we would present them with a terminal, they would have some idea of what to do with that. Uh, and we, it was obviously important that uh, applications integrate with the UI and felt native to the Chrome OS experience. Oh, oh, too far. <laughs> there you go. Uh, okay, so um, for this uh, part of the presentation, we wanted to sort of break down all the different uh, bits and pieces that go into Crostini. There's no one Crostini program or, or piece of code out there. It's made up of kind of a constellation of daemons and protocols and, and bits that we uh, wrote for the project. And uh, sort of the, the deepest, most core part of that, I would say, uh, is CrossVM. Uh, like other uh, VMs in Linux, it uses the KVM uh, uh, kernel driver in order to actually uh, run the VM. Um, we just implement all the devices uh, and interfaces to the rest of the operating system, akin to QEMU or, or VirtualBox. Um, so CrossVM, like other VMs, uh, boots up an entire uh, guest kernel that we provide uh, and provides a very limited set of para-virtualized devices. Uh, so it's not emulating any real hardware that's out there, other than some like really basic stuff. Um, and the reason we wanted to do this, uh, as opposed to implementing a, a richer set of devices, is that we wanted to limit the attack service as much as possible. Uh, one of the reasons we didn't go with uh, QEMU uh, or even KVM tool, which is like a very small uh, VM, uh, is because they're both big piles of C code that have historically been uh, uh, exploited. Uh, you know, they, they have a lot of uh, device support and, uh, you know, being written in, a, in C nowadays is kind of a recipe for uh, finding, you know, common C exploits, you know, double freeze, buffer overruns, that kind of thing. Uh, so the less code, the better. Additionally, we wrote it, in, uh, wrote it with sandboxing in mind, uh, kind of akin to how Chrome separates all of its processes into different, or all of its tabs into different processes. We wanted to separate all of the devices we supported into uh, separate processes that are very well sandboxed. Uh, for example, the block device, uh, the virtual block device, which serves the, uh, you know, the disk image for the, for the VM, uh, doesn't actually have access to any files. We, we open the file before we make the device, uh, fork off that process, and all it has is that already opened FD to the file, to the, to the disk image, that it can uh, serve to the guest with no privileges whatsoever. So even if the guest were to somehow break out and you know, exploit the disk uh, device, it wouldn't have access to anything it didn't already have, namely the disk and its own memory. Um, additionally, uh, not just wanting to rely on one layer of security, we wrote it in Rust, which is a, a newish uh, memory safe language uh, that should hopefully afford us uh, some additional security benefits over big old piles of C code that we see so uh, that we see in other VMs. All right, so uh, <laughs> moving on to other parts. So I'd like to preface this with uh, all of the names uh, or most of the names we have for the project. All the code names are. Uh, French hospitality words, uh, and they're purposefully pronounced wrongly, uh, and everybody pronounces them differently. So you may think I'm pronouncing them wrong, uh, but I, I'm actually not. That's actually how they're pronounced. Um, so 
So VM, so we got the two VM managers here, uh, Concierge and Ciceroni. Um, <laughs> Uh, originally, uh, I, I want to put these ones together because originally it was actually one uh, piece, uh, just concierge, which managed the lifetime for all the VMs because there could be multiple VMs running on your Chromo system. Uh, so this would manage them all for us. Um, and Chrome could use it to actually start uh, cross instances because Chrome itself in Chrome OS doesn't have very many privileges, so we needed to have a privilege daemon that Chrome could poke and tell it to launch these things. Additionally, it was responsible for setting up the networking uh, and responding to uh, certain requests to start containers uh, or launch applications. Uh, we've since made it so concierge handles the starting of VMs, but once a VM is started, we no longer consider uh, we, we no longer consider it trusted enough for concierge to talk about. Remember, concierge is privileged, so we made a, a kind of fork, you know, forked end of it of it called Ciceroni that would just handle communication from the VM after it was launched that has far less privileges. So Ciceroni can't launch VMs, but it can help service other kinds of requests like launching applications. Uh, I think that's it for that one. Uh, so the image that's actually booted uh, is called Termina, which is not a misspelling of terminal as many people think uh, it is. Um, just a code name. Uh, it's read-only, cryptographically signed, isn't really that useful uh, for developers to use, except that you use it to launch containers. It's, it's really the bare minimum just to launch a container uh, using LXD. I'll get more to that later. Um, it additionally contains uh, all the architecture-specific binaries that are used to uh, help integrate containers into Chrome OS. Uh, again, which I'll get um, into those later. But basically, uh, when you launch a container inside of uh, Termina, uh, these binaries are bind mounted into the container, and the container itself can use those uh, to, to do uh, some integration. Uh, oh, OK, yeah. So this one's called Mate Red. Um, <laughs> I promise you, that's what we all call it. <laughs> um, so this one is, uh, I guess, uh, akin to uh, System D or something like that. It's the PID one of the, that root uh, uh, guest image that's booted by CrossVM. Uh, it's pretty simple. It doesn't really do many things dynamically. It's mostly the, just there to set up networking and launch containers uh, as Chrome and Concierge and Cicerone uh, request them to be started. Uh, it's controlled using gRPC, which is basically just protobufs uh, over um, over the wire. Uh, oh, so I mentioned uh, a few slides ago um, about LXD. So, uh, you know, and containers in Linux often come in many forms. Some people use, you know, Docker, Kubernetes, um, clear containers. I mean, I can, the list goes on and on. Uh, we decided to use LXD in this case because, well, one, it already exists uh, and is pretty, pretty well known. Two, it's uh, unlike Docker, meant for, instead of running microservices, entire system containers. Um, this is more suited to what the kind of environment uh, CrossDN provides, which is kind of a full Linux environment. It's not meant for, uh, like Docker, to be running you know, tiny you know, single processes or one database, or something like that. So it, it fit pretty well for the project. Additionally, people can use it to uh, launch containers that are stored in other repositories other than ones that we provide. So if people wanted to, they could you know, grab an Arch uh, Linux container or a Gentoo uh, Linux container uh, if that's the kind of environment they wanted. However, we provide a Debian-flavored one, which everything just kind of works. Um, but there's nothing special about it other than that's the one we uh, fully maintain. Uh, oh, and I think uh, this is one of the last pieces here. <laughs> Hopefully um, we've gotten through most of them. So this one uh, it basically just... Uh, sort of a bit of polish. Originally, when you start a container uh, or a VM, uh, we would start up an SSH server, um, and then you'd use the SSH app inside of Chrome OS uh, to connect. And this was kind of cumbersome. Sometimes the network wouldn't come up properly, uh, or sometimes there'd be issues with key exchange. And you know, it's basically overkill when you're contacting a shell that's inside of your system anyways. You know, there's no network, there's no way somebody could access your VMs that was hostile. So we devised a very simple shell protocol using VSOC, uh, which we use in, for communication for many of our components uh, that allows you to uh, connect to your container or your VM. Ah. 
Raven's turn. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, so we, so we have the BSOC uh, way of connecting, and that gives you the terminal, and that's always available, which is sort of a nice fallback if everything else fails. But we, of course, want uh, a better UI experience. We want graphical applications that also work within this uh, environment. Uh, a little bit of background about Chrome OS uh, to understand how the UI integration works. Uh, Chrome OS graphics stack is built on the DRM subsystem in the Linux kernel, and display compositing is implemented by Chrome. Uh, on newer Chromebooks, we make use of hardware overlays for a lot of the presentation which makes uh, things like video playback and Android applications very efficient. Um, basically, anything that's backed by uh, a DMA buff, well, any content that's backed by a DMA buff, uh, will typically end up using a hardware overlay when presented on the screen. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, we added support for Wayland compositor APIs to Chrome to support Android applications. Uh, and that's what we're using for Linux applications, obviously, to allow them to integrate. Uh, Wayland protocol is the standard uh, compositor protocol that's being used on modern Linux distributions these days. Uh, one thing that's different from our Android use case, uh, Android applications are not running in a virtual machine. They're just running inside a container. So it's relatively easy for us to provide a socket that allows Android to connect to the Chrome uh, compositor. However, when we have a virtual machine, we needed to somehow bridge these two worlds. And to do that, we created a special Vertio device that uh, provides that. No, there we go. So um, that special Vertio device is called Vertio Wayland. Um, as, uh, as you saw on a few slides ago, we have several Vertio devices, or Vertio family devices, and so it made sense for us to implement this device on top of Vertio as well. However, Vertio, Vert.io uh, mostly just provides a, uh, you know, a generic set of queues for which you can submit commands back and forth between the host, uh, CrossVM in this case, and the guest, the, the Linux kernel we were running. Um, so what we need, but the, the problem is that the Wayland protocol um, sends more than just bytes back and forth between the compositor and client applications. It also likes to send uh, file descriptors across. This is used, uh, for example, for frame buffers. Um, they're using shared memory. They'll still make an FD for that shared memory, send it across the wire, and the compositor then doesn't have to read the entire frame buffer out of a, a byte stream. It can read it out of the shared memory. Uh, other things like key maps are shared this way. Um, uh, clipboard contents are shared using pipes, so pipe pairs. You know, one end gets sent over, and you can use that for copy paste. Um, and unfortunately, these things do not work inside of a VM environment or across a VM environment. Uh, a file descriptor made by a guest application or client application, the guest for shared memory, isn't going to make any sense at all to the host's kernel, and that's where the compositor runs. Um, so the way we got around this, basically, uh, is with Vertio Wayland, is that when the guest wants to make one of those shared memory things or a pipe or, or whatever, it requests one from Vertio Wayland. Uh, the Vertio Wayland uh, protocol is then used to request one from CrossVM. Uh, CrossVM is running on the host. It can ask the host kernel for a shared memory using shmemget or, or memfd create or, or a pipe using pipe. <laughs> um, and then it will associate that host side file descriptor with a virtual file descriptor that gets sent down as just an ID, just an integer, to the guest kernel, which will then turn it into a file descriptor on the guest side, which can then be used by the client application as normal. This is totally transparent to the, uh, to the host uh, compositor, to Chrome, uh, but it wasn't at all transparent for the, for the guests, uh, the guest clients. The way we kind of got around that initially was, well, most uh, client applications weren't programmed against Wayland directly. They were programmed, programmed against frameworks like GTK3 or Qt. So we'd modify those uh, frameworks, patch them into the containers, 
so that they would create frame buffers or, or do clipboard uh, the way we kind of needed them to, which was a, usually a small modification, but that small modification across you know, n different frameworks was a huge uh, maintenance burden and a big pain. And of course, wouldn't reach every application out there. If your application happened to be programmed with raw Wayland, it would have no idea of what was going on. Um, so this kind of leads us to uh, this next part that we made, uh, called actually, how do, we, how do you pronounce this one? Uh, some layer. Oh, <laughs> there you go. Some some layer. <laughs> uh, yeah, our solution to this problem was to create. Uh, a nested Wayland compositor, like a proxy compositor, that would be running inside uh, the guest container. Um, and what it would do is, um, first it would, you know, this would be one of those pieces that we would uh, have as part of the VM root image and we just bind mount it into the container. So every container would have a reliable version of um, some only are running inside of it, or it would have the binary available uh, to it. Uh, and uh, we, the way it works is we have a number of instances inside each container. Uh, we have one instance that we call the master Samoye, and uh, it creates the Wayland socket the normal guest clients will connect to. Uh, as soon as the client connects to this, uh, this socket, it will actually spawn a new instance of Sommelier that will serve just that client. This new instance of Sommelier um, is relatively simple because it only ever has to deal with one client. And if, uh, if, it, ever, if it would ever do something like run out of memory or crash for other reasons, it would only take down this one Wayland client. So that's a nice property of, uh, of just isolation. Uh, between applications. Uh, but it would establish a connection to the host using the Verde Wayland uh, driver in the guest kernel. And uh, it will just forward the traffic that comes from the client uh, over this new connection it created. And um, uh, for example, if uh, the client was trying to do copy and paste, uh, the client would send a pipe to the proxy compositor, uh, we would then create one of these special um, socket pairs that would be able to cross the host guest boundary, and we would just forward the data through that one. And it works sim a similar way for um, frame buffers and content. Uh, it's a little bit different. We, we actually we get shared memory from the client, uh, but then we would actually allocate one of these DMA buff that are sh DMA buffs that are shared with the host, and we'll copy the data out of the application's local guest shared memory into the DMA buff. And then we do a good job at tracking damage to minimize the copies. But essentially, we copy into the D DMA buff, and then this DMA buff is forwarded to the host compositor. Um, this is very efficient because this copy that we're doing to the DMA buff, uh, that's a copy that would happen on the host side anyhow, because once the host composite would receive a frame from an application that produced content in shared memory, uh, we would have to do a texture upload. And essentially, a texture upload is us copying from some uh, user memory into a DMA buff that can then be used for texturing in the compositor or uh, set up as a hardware overlay for scan out. Uh, the last thing that someone will do is handle uh, some more advanced uh, DPI scaling. Uh, you, Chrome S has quite advanced support for changing the density of the display and multi-monitor to make that a little bit e better supported for the applications. Uh, Sommelier allows us to dynamically change that per application. We support X11. Um, however, there's no X server running on Chrome S. Like I mentioned before, Chrome S is just running on top of the DRM subsystem. There's no X server uh, on the host side. We really didn't want to add an X server on the host side, 
and we really didn't want to add a X11 channel from the untrusted guest to the host side. So what we decided to do is instead of instead of running an X server next to the host compositor and opening up that attack surface, we run X Wayland uh, inside the guest. And uh, Sommelier will act as the window manager for that X Wayland session. And all the window manager requests that it will receive from applications would then be translated into standard Wayland protocol. Um, there's some things that just can't be translated well. It would be a security risk to add protocol uh, to do it. Add some things like being able to capture where the input, capture input devices or uh, control uh, placement of windows with absolute coordinates. Some of those things are just things we don't want to allow uh, from the security point of view. However, we do pretty well uh, still. Um, so input events, you know, if x doesn't have focus, then you're just not going to see where the mouse cursor is. Uh, I'll, I'll show a demo of this later. Uh, you'll understand what kind of side effects that leads, leads to. Um, then all, all placement of windows will be relative to some other window for security reasons. Uh, so um, if you do uh, some pop-up window, a menu, it will always be placed relative to, to another window. We, what we do is we always place it relative to the active window, and that works well for most applications. Uh, there's some other side effects, like the way that pop-ups works in X11 is that the client will just grab input, and then it will detect if you click on a different application, and then it will decide to dismiss a menu. It can't see that click in our case, so the dismissing of pop-ups might not work perfectly for X11. For Wayland, where we have a good secure protocol for handling all this, that's, that works perfectly. The last thing that uh, is hard to get right with X11 applications is high DPI support. Some applications support it, some do not. Uh, even if they support it, it's very rare that they support dynamic changes to density. Most of them, if they have support, will read the DPI value as startup and they'll stick to that. Uh, so we we decided to have X Wayland always run with one fixed DPI value. And uh, uh, we decided to use the preferred density of the internal panel on the Chromebook as a choice. So if that's where the application is being displayed, it will, uh, it will be I ideal. There won't be any overhead in terms of having to scale it to appear at the right size. And uh, let's move on to launcher integration. Um, Chrome OS, to integrate with the Chrome OS launcher, we have uh, another service running inside the container called Garçon, or Garcon. <laughs> and uh, same thing, this is bound mounted into the container. So you don't have to, uh, we don't have to worry about providing it with a package or the user failing to update a package to have the right version. Uh, you'll get, you all automatically have the binary in your container that is working with your version of Chrome OS. Uh, it will handle, so we'll, yeah, it will communicate with the host over gRPC and it will handle things like URL intents. So if you click on a URL inside the guest, uh, the default behavior will be that uh, Garçon will contact the host and your URL will actually open in your normal host side version of Chrome. Uh, that's, it's, you, can, you can change it, you can configure it, but the default behavior is to open it in host side Chrome. Uh, Garçon will also monitor all your desktop files in the standard locations. So if you install an application, it will communicate that back to the launcher on, inside of Chrome, and uh, the launcher in Chrome will you know, add an icon for this application. And if you click an icon uh, in the launcher in Chrome, that will communicate with Garçon to tell Garçon to actually launch that application. Uh, so we also support a uh, form of file integration. Um, basically, it's uh, we on the default container, 
open up a SFTP only SSH server uh, running on port 2222. Uh, and we use that to connect, uh, to have Chrome connect to the container uh, and then to share files with it. And then Chrome can display those files in the ordinary Chrome OS files app. Um, this is super handy for like transferring files between containers. Uh, or transferring things from your downloads to your container or into Google Drive in your container. So, you know, we, we just threw a bunch of uh, terms at you, at you all, and uh, in order to help summarize these things and to see how it all fits together, we have this slide that shows you the life of an app. Um, it's, it kind of goes into a lot of detail, but it, it hits all of the things we sort of talked about just then, uh, just now. Um, and again, this is for an application uh, from a cold start. So this is, you haven't run any containers, you haven't run any VMs yet, you've just booted your Chromebook, and you click on an app that you'd already installed before. Here's sort of what happens behind the scenes. So the user will click an icon. Um, this is handled by Chrome. Chrome doesn't just run the Chrome windows. Chrome handles the entire UI, including the launcher. And Chrome will then tell uh, DebugD, which is a special, silly named uh, daemon in Chrome OS that kind of handles miscellaneous tasks that are privileged that Chrome doesn't have privilege for, uh, to start Concierge. Concierge uh, will then start a cross VM instance, uh, and boot, it'll boot one of those Termina images. Uh, once that happens, the init one, or the, the PID one in Termina, made red, will ping Concierge with a little message that says, I'm ready to go. Concierge will tell uh, MadeRed in return, please start a container, with, and then do that with LXC. So LXC will run uh, in the usual way, and as part of its job as, running, as being a system container runner, it will start up the init process, uh, which will include Garçon, which we've already installed uh, for the default container as a service uh, that will get launched automatically. And then Cicerone, Remember, that was forked off from concierge uh, to handle communication with, uh, with uh, VMs and guests. Uh, we'll tell Garçon to launch an application. Uh, that application uh, will then do some stuff that we're going to tell you about. Uh, yeah, so then the application will connect to this socket that the master sommelier created. And the master sommelier will spawn a, another instance of sommelier. That instance will then establish a connection to the host compositor using Virtio Wayland. Uh, on the host side, um, the compositor will communicate with the launcher inside of Chrome to ensure that uh, the launcher item for this application gets connected to this new window. Um, then, uh, sometime after that, you'll have the application to actually produce some content. So uh, Somalia will rec receive a frame uh, in, uh, in the form of some shared memory. Um, Somalia will then copy the contents from that shared memory into a DMA buff uh, that can be shared with the host and forwarded to the host, where uh, eventually Chrome will uh, produce another frame, e either using uh, compositing with some effects or uh, if possible, by using a hardware overlay to present the app. Some limitations. I think I've already touched on a few of these. Um, there are no, there are no uh, Super X11 apps. You can't write a X11 window manager that will replace the Chrome OS behavior. That won't work. You can't lock the screen from an X11 app. Uh, you'll probably you'll lock all the X11 apps, but you're not going to affect Chrome OS. Uh, if you do screen capture, you're going to end up only seeing X11 apps in your capture, and uh, none of the Chrome apps or none of the Wayland apps. Uh, and some accessibility features will also not work through X11 if you rely on uh, tracking the cursor, etc. Uh, there's no raw access to hardware devices. Yeah. Uh, additionally, I remember somebody asked me about this a while ago. They wanted to do, uh, again, I'm not a, a networking person at all, so 
sorry if I flubbed the terms, but they were trying to do layer two network access, which as I understand is like sending ether raw ethernet packets over Wi-Fi. Uh, you can't do that in Chrome. You definitely can't do that inside of a container. So that's not something you'll be able to do. Additionally, there's no uh, nested KVM access, so you can't run another VM inside of uh, CrossGenie. Um, this is basically due to just some security issues uh, that we haven't really been able to iron out. Uh, I don't think we'll, I'm not sure we'll be able to, and so that's just not something that we're going to support. Yeah, and uh, you won't be able to access Chrome data like cookies or credentials or any of that. Um, and then we have some, there's some limitations that we're planning to solve, but currently there's no sound. Uh, you don't have access to USB devices. Uh, there's no graphics acceleration at this time, and there's no IPv6 support. But uh, these things are being worked on, and uh, we're hoping to solve them in the near future. OK, here are some instructions uh, for those of you who want to give this a try. Um, the easiest is to use the Pixelbook. That's uh, other devices supported too, but the Pixelbook is probably the one that's the most tested. So if you have a Pixelbook, the one thing you need to do is you need to get on the dev channel. So that is, you do not have to put the machine in dev mode. It can keep being secure. You just need to get on the dev channel so you get a recent enough build of Chrome OS for this to be enabled. Eventually, it will make it to beta and stable, but for the time being, dev channel is the only way where this works. Once you're on the dev channel, you will, you know, you should get an update fairly quickly, and then you can navigate to your settings page, and you will find uh, a Linux apps uh, setting, and you click the turn on button, and that will download uh, the base supported container. And uh, it will, de how long it takes will depend on your internet connection, but hopefully in a few minutes. Uh, you should have a terminal pop-up, and you're good to go. Uh, in addition, you don't have to necessarily use that Start Linux uh, Apps button in the Settings menu. That's the smoothest path forward. It automatically starts everything you need for you with the default container that we provide. But we didn't really want to limit people in that way. Uh, if you want, you can start other VMs. So every different VM you start will get its own uh, section of, uh, or own read-write area for storing container images. Um, so you can have them nicely siloed from one another. Uh, so uh, the way to start a, a different VM, a distinct VM from the ones uh, that are started by default, uh, is to open up the uh, Chrome shell or Crosh, which is a little utility shell, not a, not a real one. You open that up uh, on any Chromebook with Control-T, and you can enter that command there, VMC start, well, insert name there. Uh, and then you'll be presented with uh, a shell into that uh, rootfs, that minimal rootfs I mentioned, the terminal image. Uh, you can use that, uh, you, you know, basically it doesn't have anything useful on other than LXC and that read-write area uh, for storing containers that LXC will already have been configured to point to. And then you could use uh, ordinary LXC commands uh, to start an alternative container. In this case, uh, on that example command uh, is just uh, you know, starting an Arch Linux uh, image. That AMD64 is there uh, because not every Chromebook is actually running AMD64, so we're explicit in this case that this is a Pixelbook or other uh, uh, x86 device use AMD64. If you're using uh, an ARM Chromebook, you would replace that with the appropriate architecture. And then you could name the container wherever you want. Use LXC as normal or, or, or pretty normal. <laughs> Um, to control your containers, delete them, make new ones, start, stop, that kind of thing. I think it w it's worth pointing out that uh, if you use your own, not our supported container, uh, you'll have these um, integration points or these binaries that allows you to integrate. They will be bind mounted into your container, but they might not be started by default. So you'll have the uh, gar the Garcon and the Sommelier binary in there, you might just have to add it to your system D or equivalent setup to get them running, uh, but they will be there. Yeah, uh, and just one more thing we like to add is that um, 
you know, there's nothing special about the default container other than it's the smoothest path to start. If you were to say start a new container or a new VM, a new container, uh, and then started Garçon and, and all those others and installed an app, that app icon that appears will be associated with that VM container name tuple. So you could, if you wanted to, you know, just use a totally different uh, container for a certain application that you'd want siloed, and it'll work uh, just as you'd expect. For, you know, every container is a first-class citizen of the UI integration. Uh, okay, here are some, um, some things you could, should think about if you want to make your applications work well uh, in Crostini. As a developer. As a developer, yes. Uh, try to use Wayland. Do not use X11 if possible. Uh, Wayland integration will be perfect. Uh, if it, it's not perfect, you can file a bug and we will fix it. Um, ideally, you'd use a toolkit. That's probably the most like. It's most likely that it'll work perfectly if you use a toolkit because we're probably going to be better at testing testing that. Uh, for example, UTK three or similar. Uh, if you would like uh, efficient video playback today, before we've added acceleration of that, you can actually use Wayland Sync for GStreamer. Uh, and that will give you pretty good uh, software decode performance uh, because it gives you an optimal presentation path. Uh, and yeah, did I mention try to use Wayland and not X11? Uh, if you have to use X11, um, then try to not depend on global information like absolute coordinates or the pointer position. And um, don't capture the screen or any of that. That's just not going to work. Uh, try to support high DPI because basically all the Chromebooks, all the new Chromebooks out there are going to be high DPI devices. Uh, if you don't support it, you're either going to appear tiny or we're going to have to scale you up and you'd be blurry. Uh, so try to support high DPI. Uh, it's fine to just read the DPI value from screen zero of the X server and uh, use that information. That, that will make your application appear in an ideal way on the internal panel of the Chromebook. Uh, yeah, so we'll uh, try to post these slides somewhere so you don't have to copy these links down too quick. But this is just to, uh, the first link there is to an FAQ that we've written up. Um, Additionally, we have some links to the source code repositories. Um, all those binaries I mentioned before, the source code for them is freely available. It's uh, exactly as you'll see on those uh, repositories there. Cross VM, VM tools uh, will contain, you know, Smalley, Garcon, there's a, you know, a whole bunch of them there. Uh, additionally, if you'd want to, like, uh, ask discussion questions or something, that's the general Chromium OS uh, discuss list. Uh, we linked a little bit earlier if you want to have feedback specific to Crostini, so like, oh, everything's crashed, you can actually press a, a key combo that'll send us some feedback. Uh, additionally, shout out to R. Crostini on Reddit. They are pretty helpful uh, if you've got problems, um, especially for like, you know, going off the beaten path. They, those people love to experiment and probably have some advice if you do too. Um, so. Oh, and we're hiring on Chrome OS, so. You know, if you feel like you want to work on this or other Chrome OS jobs, please send us your resumes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, now Raven is going to show you some demos. Yeah, I'll give you some demos, and then we'll do Q&A after that. Sounds good? Oh, can you bump the font on that? Control plus, I think, should work. Oh, yeah. There we go. Is, uh, is that readable to everybody? Cool. Um, all right, let's start with something, uh, something simple. Um, let's just run dedit. This is a GTK application. It's a simple text editor. 
Um, and this, this works as expected, and uh, performance should be quite good. Um, like pop-ups and all that works perfectly. For example, if I click this pop-up here, um, if I click somewhere else here, it will be dismissed properly, and the, the type of things you expect to work will work. Um, then let's try uh, let's try an X, X application. Uh, maybe we'll do uh, uh, Sublime Text. This works quite well too. Um, the it's still it's X11, so the integration might not be as perfect as a uh, native Wayland application, but um, you know most things will work uh, just fine, and performance should be uh, should be quite good. Um, now let's do something that doesn't work as well. Uh, let's start um, Xize. Um, so this, you know, it works as expected here right now. Um, However, if I let's say I move that over there, and then the pointer goes here, now you'll see that it has no idea that the the, the mouse cursor is actually moving around, um, and that's what we want for security reasons. Uh, if I start another X application, uh, you'll see an interesting side effect. So we have X I still running up here. Um, when I go to this X application, now Xize will start seeing input events again, but it's a bit confused about where those in input events are coming from. This is the side effect of us actually e placing all the X applications. They're centered on screen. Um, the actual location where you see them is not the location they see. We do that to make you know, some behavior work a little bit better. For example, um, pop-up menus will be less likely to appear off-screen uh, off and uh, so on. Uh, what else should we try? VS Code, try an Electron app. <laughs> so these applications are always kind of funny to run because uh, being Electron applications, they're running a Chromium instance, uh, you know, in totally inside this VM, and then rendering it all and shipping it over Wayland. Yeah, uh, but the performance is still pretty good. And like you saw him scrolling there, um, and uh, Electron apps are currently all, all X11, but eventually they should be gaining uh, a better and better Wayland support. And once they upgrade uh, to a newer version of Electron with Wayland support. Uh, performance and integration should be a little bit better. Yeah, that's currently uh, being uh, worked on inside of Chrome. Start one from the launcher. You haven't yeah. done that yet, I don't think. That's a good idea. Um, let's do... Oh, GIMP. Let's do GIMP. All right. I mean, the GIMP. <laughs> you don't want to get it wrong. Um, um, oh, why don't one we thing, uh, use oh. the... F let's use the file integration. Yeah. Oh, one thing while he's, while he's finding a, a good image to use um, is that we have a, a material design theme uh, that supports both light and dark themes uh, that all applications will use by default uh, in our container. So right. not only is the... Oh, do we lose internet? Yeah, we lost internet. Oh, but, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll figure something out. Can you, yeah. Download image. Can I do that here? God. Oh, take a screenshot. That'll give you an image. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> so we made the screenshot. We would really like to do some photo editing on it, though. So let's go to the Files app. And here's my screenshot. And we'll see that we have something called Linux files here. And we'll just uh, drag that guy into the Downloads folder. And then I'll make my way back to GIMP. And there we go. There we go. And then I'm going to be fancy, and I'm going to use my pixel book pen. 
and uh, only a hundred dollars on Amazon. Do some edits using it here, and it might be obviously hard to see on the big screen, but it's pretty good latency. Latency actually. Uh, let's see what else can we do. Let's ignore that. Um, we had maybe we should start Android Studio. Show that that's. Working. That was <laughs> one of the original goals. One of the original was Android Studio. Cases. Um, for uh, uh, during uh, Google I/O this year, when we uh, first kind of announced the the preview of Cross Uni here, um, we were running Android Studio on Pixelbooks uh, in order for people to do the sort of uh, code labs, uh, and we wanted them to actually have to test the apps. Uh, Currently, that's not something that you can do on normal mode Chromebooks, but if you switch it over to dev mode, um, you can actually run the, uh, the Android applications on the Android integration of Chrome OS, so you could instantly test things without having uh, a VM in the way and allow you to actually you know, experience the applications. However, sideloading uh, apps, uh, untrusted apps, I don't think is supported on normal mode Chromebooks, which is why you have to switch to dev mode. Uh, we'll probably have something uh, better in the future, but um, yeah. And once uh, we get better USB support, then you could build for uh, maybe a phone or um, something that you plug in. Yep. Yeah. Uh, yeah so this this works fine. Ooh, show my uh, Firefox. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, it, oh, it's, there, oh it, there it was. Uh, let's not do that. Nah, I think we lost the network here. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I th it's okay. Use my f use you can my use phone. your imagination to, you know, insert Firefox websites here rather than just the tabs. Okay, while we're waiting on that to come up, um, Let's go back here. I can um, I can show video playback working. And this is a uh, what resolution is this one? Uh, I think this is a uh, 1080p 60 FPS video um, that um, uh, runs pretty smoothly in set hour, I guess. Right, I have internet. Do you have internet now? <laughs> All right, that, that works well. Um, what else we got? I'm trying to think. <laughs> yeah, we we can run Chrome. Um, or if you, did you already? I don't, already, have, I don't have, already have one installed. installed. But, well, I can use uh, Firefox to download Chrome, I guess. Click on the click on the ad link. <laughs> oh no! I guess Deb uh, would make sense because we're run we're running. Uh, I, I mentioned this kind of offhand before, but we're running uh, basically Debian um, stretch. stretch. Yeah. Um. So. Uh, which one? Well, I think that was the the download, the Firefox's little download pop up. Uh, I, I, it uses, I think, it uses a bit of alpha transparency, uh, which um, isn't working quite right. <laughs> oh, is this Heather with your phone? Yeah, <laughs> it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So. The nice part is once you install an application, like even if he was using apt-get, which is how we install most of his other applications, you'll instantly see an icon for it. Like I'm trying to think of uh, one you, you could run that you haven't installed yet that you could demonstrate that for. 
You know, someone, someone name an application that you can install with apt-get. GVim? GVim should work. Uh, no, I, d I think when I did the install here, I did sudo. While we're at it, <laughs> we don't get an icon for Google Chrome there, unfortunately. But it does launch. Yeah. <laughs> uh, is GVM up yet? That should have installed. Yep. There you go. That's yeah. It covers it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's uh why don't we open it up for questions? Yep. I think uh, you're supposed to go up to the mic so that the video recording will get it. Um is there going to be a graphical installer eventually? <laughs> Uh, graphical installer for the whole process, the, or starting a, uh, to install a apps like Chrome or uh, Graphical Vim or any Linux app, because right now you have to do it through the uh, command line, right? Yes, yeah, so that's correct. So when you initially start it, the first thing you're presented with is a terminal um, into that Debian environment. Um, Debian, I think, probably has a handful of graphical package managers, and if you wanted to use one of those. Uh, as a user, that would be your choice. Kind of, we aren't pushing it on anybody. As we, as as we even alluded to before, we're kind of targeting developers at first, and hopefully, you know, if that's the kind of thing you wanted to do, you could install it, and and then you should be good to go. To answer your question. Yeah, basically, uh, if there's a graphical installer, it'll be open to a bigger audience, I guess, eventually. Possibly. Yeah, I think I think we there might be some plans where, um, if you download a deb file or you have one in your files app, you might be able to just click that one and that will automatically install it. It wouldn't give you like a full installer, but it would at least t make that step a little bit easier. Okay, that was my question. Thank you. All right. Uh, two questions. Um, first of all, uh, what kind of USB support is planned? Stuff uh, like YubiKeys? Yeah, so, um, so what we're currently working on is basically allowing some similar permissions as uh, like what exists for web USB today. So first of all, if a USB uh, device is used by the Chrome OS system itself, like if it's a mouse or a keyboard, it won't be accessible uh, because that would be a security issue if somebody could capture your keyboard like that. Um, but like things like that we kind of have in mind are like your Arduinos uh, or other microcontrollers, you know, USB serial converters, that kind of thing. So that when you plug those in, like Chrome and the kernel on the host system have you know no desire to interface with those things, and so you would be able to do that uh, is the kind of what we're the level we're looking at for hobbyists and, and like that. So that answer your question, okay? Yep. Where would the YubiKey fit? I guess it's uh, that is a that is a good question. I'm not I'm not certain what the permission model for that is. The, honestly, the tricky part of these things is just getting the UX right. There's right. not a lot of technical stuff in the way, but. You know, we've got a, a high bar for security, right. and asking security questions to users is very tricky, I think. Um, the other question is, can you suspend the container? Well, really the VM, right? Um, no. Today you cannot suspend the VM, but that being said, when you close your laptop, um, the whole thing, the whole system suspends, um, like including Chrome OS, right. and then it comes back up. But um, if you reboot, then you lose the VM. Yes, that's correct. Okay. Um, Any plans for suspend? Support? I mean, I think LXC might support some form of suspension, but that may be, I, I understand that's maybe not what okay. we're thinking of, so I don't, I don't think that's in the cards right now. Cool. Thanks. 
So this may be a slightly rude question, but this <laughs> seems like a hell of a lot of work. Why not just build yet another container format and expose the host kernel a little more natively so that way you don't have to jump through all of these hoops? Yeah, I'm, that is a really good question. We, we kind of see it all the time. Um, so thank you for asking. Uh, basically, um, on Chrome OS, we have the you know we have the, the security opinion that exposing the kernel is a little bit too much. It's kind of a large surface, especially with related to certain uh, interfaces like the the uh, DRM, the the uh, graphics interface to the kernel. Uh, that tends to be huge and ever changing, and historically uh, had issues that would allow people to gain access to the kernel. And once people uh, or uh, you know, malicious software gains access to the kernel, of course, it's game over. So we needed to isolate that as much as possible, uh, is why we decided to go through all these hoops. OK, thank you. Uh, two questions. Uh, with the kind of tight uh, usage of Wayland, any um, any hope for graphic acceleration with uh, using like the Vulkan API, libvirt GPU, um, or uh, Intel's GVTG? Uh, <laughs> it's not one I'm working on. Um, yeah. So, you know, when we first started out with this project, we kind of acknowledged for ourselves that GPU would be a bit of a long shot. Uh, you know, all of the ones you've mentioned are ones that we've thought about doing. Um, Currently, I've been experimenting with the Virgil style approach. Um, you know, I think you know I've got a bunch of code up there. I've got uh, you know uh, bug issues that you can sort of subscribe to, but nothing is guaranteed, especially a timeline. There's a chance. There's a lot of security issues, uh, as I alluded to before, with trying to expose GPU in a safe manner. Uh, did you have anything to add to that? Uh, no, I think what we have today, if you're interested in running like games, then uh, you, it's not going to be the best experience. Um, in the developer experience, like the experience of running standard IDEs and so on, uh, our DMA buff solution works quite well for that case. Um, I mean, we've done some testing what the difference would be if we provided acceleration uh, by just testing within uh, Crouton and similar. And you wouldn't gain any performance for your normal uh, editors and so on. If anything, you might even lose performance when you use acceleration there. The, because they're, they're very well designed uh, to work with software rendering. So, um, uh, so that works well. But yeah, the ga games and more advanced uh, visualization uh, will need some acceleration someday. Yeah. And, and, and believe me, I as a gamer you know, really want to see it happen. Uh, so hopefully, hopefully I'll get my wish. Yeah, I mean, if if I could utilize, you know, like Vulcan and Virgil uh, on it, that would be fantastic. Uh, and I guess the second question is, uh, can I run Christini on uh, Fuchsia? <laughs> I I don't know what the, what's what is he talking about? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Got it. Cool. <clears throat> Got a couple here. Um, so uh, thanks for all the work. Uh, I used Crouton a bunch uh, and lost a couple workspaces here and there and <laughs> loved it and hated it and uh, tried to do actually some Arduino stuff and failed miserably. Um, but yeah, overall, I thought it was awesome. Um, one thing that I'm bummed about actually is the sound because you can't run things like CMUs or something like that. So obviously. Um, can you run all of these things in guest mode? So I don't know what the current uh, Chrome OS sort of protocols are, but I used to basically run guest mode and then go into uh, my Crouton instances. And basically that was you know, totally insecure, but at the same time I didn't have to like log into with any Google credentials. Yep, what's the uh, status? So I know that uh, I often do it in guest mode when I'm developing on, like developing uh, Crostini. Uh, there's no specific ties to non-guest mode. I, I think there was like some bugs related to it that may have to be worked out. Like, I think uh, initially we weren't starting the Wayland, like we weren't actually opening the Wayland socket in guest mode because you couldn't run Arc or we couldn't run Android. Yeah, you couldn't run Android apps, <laughs> so we wouldn't um, we wouldn't provide that socket and it would fail for that reason. But yeah, I, I think, think that's you, fixed. Yeah, I think that's fixed. I think you should uh, should be good. And uh, if it doesn't work, file a bug and we'll. 
see what we can do. Uh, of course, you wouldn't have persist persistence. Um, that was like okay. in guest mode. Yeah. You know, you you log out. It's all your stuff's gone. So the persistence model. Uh, you said that on a reboot, all of these VMs basically disappear. So does that mean that if you turn the machine off, even if you're logged in with full credentials, all of these VMs go away? Oh no, sorry. They're stored in persistent storage. Okay. It's just that uh, the the persistent storage used for guest mode, like. You know, they when you log out of guest mode, the key is thrown away. Right. Essentially, you you have no access to it anymore. No, nobody could have access to it anymore. Do you save the sort of state of the VMs or the containers so that if you had, say, a USB key, you could sort of save your state of your container while in guest mode and then just upload that back into the system? Uh, so we're actually working on external storage support for containers. So you know, SD card or USB card. Um, I yeah I I guess the sort of use case like we were thinking backups, but for your use case I think it would work. It might not be super convenient, um, but we're we're kind of um, stymied right now. That feature is kind of blocked on spaces in in device names. <laughs> believe it or not, huh? Like okay. if your device name has a space in it, like the the, the volume label, it'll actually confuse things. Anyway, that's just a fun little bug. Right. Um, are there a lot of, so all of these, uh, I've never seen like binded, m bind mounting those words together in terms of, um, I don't know, operating systems. Uh, so does that mean that there are a lot of, are there binary globs that aren't actually like source that you can see? Oh, so sorry, I, I uh, maybe glossed over in one of the slides, the, all the links at the end. None of them are binary blobs. Um, they're all compiled from open source repositories. There's no reason you have to use those blobs, uh, but those are always going to be up to date and guaranteed to work with the host system. You know, if you try to compile them yourself, go ahead. They might not be up to date if you have a version mismatch, um, but you know, all the power to you. There's nothing special about them other uh, than my, I mean, my when working on sommelier, my typical workflow is that. I would, uh, I mean, I would have the source code inside a Crostini container, and I would build my own version of Sommelier and use that instead of the version that came from the uh, came from the VM and that was bind, bind, bind mounted. So you can easily take that code, modify Sommelier to your needs, and run that instead if you want. Hmm. Thanks. Welcome. So, so you guys work for Google, right? Right. Yeah. So, um, Chrome OS. Um, uh, so, in business, you're supposed to probably do, have a lot of good reasons for things. Is so it was one of the reasons for Crostini um, that it better competes. It helps Chrome OS better compete with Windows and the Linux subsystem thing. <laughs> I mean, do you want to this one or should I answer it? Uh, well, we're probably not the best people to answer this. Uh, I mean, we're, we're Linux hackers. You know, we, we did it because we wanted to use our Chromebooks uh, to program. Uh, yeah. Historically hard thing to do. But I think, I think the, um, Chromebooks are widely used within education. And I think it's, it's sad that uh, while they're so popular there, you couldn't use them for um, computer science or even like some basic programming. Uh, so I think that's something, um, you know, not just us, but a lot of people have been wanting to. Uh, so why, why wasn't it built into Chrome OS from the beginning? Why wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it was initially built as just a Chrome browser as an operating system, right? It, its minimalism was the goal. Um, but I guess if you're asking why has it changed, you know, like every product that's old enough, I, I think it's natural that they change or maybe you increase in scope. Um, you know, I can really see anything beyond that. Okay. Does that, that answer your question adequately? I think so. Thank you. Cheers. Okay. Hi there. Thank you for, uh, you know, the wonderful work and putting together what seems like a really cool product and some great demos. Um, I just have a couple questions about the performance overhead, say, compared to like a crouton, CH root of uh, running an application in this setting, and if you've done like concrete measurements or report some sort of measurements about uh, what those like 13 steps of setting up the application, <laughs> and then once the application is running, the overhead of each uh, step. Um, you, you got the answer? Um, no, I think 
we have some numbers on how much overhead the virtual machine adds. It's like uh, two to six percent, I want to yeah. say. Um, you know, I mean, it depends on, depends on the the type of workload. But if you're doing compiling code, uh, I think that those are the kind of numbers you'll see. Um, and for the software rasterized graphics that you'll see in, in all these applications, uh, I don't think you'll be able to uh, notice any difference. If anything, uh, some of the optimizations we've done in terms of damage tracking and all that might actually speed up the Crostini case compared to uh, if you would run and connect directly to the host compositor uh, through Crouton. Okay, wonderful. Is, are these things that I would be able to measure on my own Chromebook? Like, I don't know what, uh, you know, if I need to set up in some dev mode and then like completely yeah. hack on the system. Yeah, the, the Crouton environment that we mentioned, if, if you're familiar with it, you can use that to sort of in dev mode, mm -hmm. you know, try to do a, set up a benchmark. Like we used to do kernel compilation. We'd do download the Linux kernel, mm -hmm. uh, just make it with the default config and compare times in Crouton. Uh, versus just inside of cross VM or inside of uh, cross Genie. Uh, it's you know I, I want to give you a quick warning. It's hard to measure things consistently, Pixelbook especially because it can get hot, and if you run things a lot, you know it'll you'll be like it's running so much slower the second time. It, it's too hot. You just need to cool it down. <laughs> and then uh, finally, is there a story for like migrating from Crouton? Um, like if I have you know a bunch of apps installed and uh, a bunch of stuff configured, uh, and no, no. I, think, no. And I mean I think there's ways you could probably do that, but you'd be on your own. You'd figure out how to check it into GitHub yeah, and download your stuff again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, in in terms of like debugging UI issues, um, is there like a way to check that? Say like there's some log saying that my app used some X11 thing that's not supported. Or some way of like figuring out that you know my app is misbehaving because of the uh, Crustini integration versus the app itself. Um, that was all you. I don't think we have any good uh, logs for that. Uh, th th those type of issues will more be that you know a window is not placed in the appropriate location, um, and uh, uh, I don't think we have any th any anything specifically for that. Uh, if you do something, if the application is doing something really bad, mm -hmm. then you might have suddenly a crash, uh, uh, and then you'll get that in your normal uh, uh, system log, and you'll be able to see that. You'll see where it crashed, and you can file uh, some feedback based on that, and we can look at it. All right, wonderful. Once again, thanks a lot for your work. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so I'm surprised no one asked this question yet, but maybe it's because everyone knows the answer. Um, I think I heard there's no VMs inside the VM, but has anyone been successful at developing Chrome OS on Chrome OS? Uh, I w I've done a lot of work on Chrome mm -hmm. inside of um, the container. Uh, the Chrome OS, the whole system, is a little bit harder to build today. You know, various pieces, like the pieces we are, have been working on, that's fine. But there's still some, some parts of it uh, that are hard to, hard to work on. Okay. You know, that's often, especially for Chrome OS, limited by CPU power. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. More than anything else. Like, you, we, gosh, if you try to build Chrome OS on a, like a, you know, even an ordinary desktop, it would be pretty slow. We work on big old workstations, yeah. you know, we, 70 we, cores. Right. Yeah, we have some distributed uh, uh, compile systems that we can use internally uh, to build Chrome and, and Chrome OS. Mm -hmm. And if you use those, it actually works quite well. Then okay. you get pretty good performance. I think some of those might also be avail available to the public. but uh, Yeah, for, for Chrome, but not for Chrome OS. Okay. I don't think it'll work for Chrome OS anyways. Okay. It was just a, kind of a silly question, but <laughs> just wondering. Um, and my last question is, uh, since uh, you guys are focused on, I guess, helping developers and allowing uh, more development on these devices, um, this might be a little out of your scope, but is, are there plans for virtual desktops like Spaces and Mac OS um, or Workspaces and GNOME on Chrome OS? 
I don't know if there's any current plans, but I, you know, I think the addition of uh, all these applications, and you know, we have Android applications. I think uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some, you know, sometime in the future there could be <laughs> some support to that. But it's, there's nothing, I'm, nothing that I'm aware of. <laughs> yeah, so. you're right in that we have no idea. Okay, <laughs> something I'm missing. I'm sure a lot of people yeah. are missing too. So I would love to see it. Um, and uh, thanks for all your work. Thanks. thanks. Hey, so currently, with if you buy a Chromebook, you can't upgrade the kernel, and it's stuck in a certain version of kernel. With your Termini, Termina VM, will you be updating the kernel in those when you up, provide updates? Uh, yes. Yeah, so the mechanism for updating the the kernel that the guest uses is different. Uh, it it kind of uses the, some of the same things. So. Okay, in Chrome OS, you have uh, these things called components, uh, which are, I think, was originally used for like the PDF viewer, uh, Flash Player is updated this way. These are things downloaded separate from the OS, but still verified um, by the system to be untampered with for security. Uh, and then we have the rootfs and the roots, uh, rootfs's kernel downloaded the same way. And those are always going to be our latest kernel that we support on Chrome OS. It's currently 4.14. I think we're targeting, you know, whatever the next LTS is. So even if you're running an older Chromebook, as long as it's running Crostini, uh, it'll get the newest guest kernel. Um, but yeah, you're, you're not going to be able to customize that one either. Uh, it'll be, you know, whatever we, we kind of put right. on there. Yeah. Having said, people have been like, oh, you know, this doesn't have this really useful kernel config. And then it'll be like, oh, we didn't realize people liked that really useful kernel config. And then we just added it, you know. Um, so if, if there's something that makes sense for everybody to have and doesn't have a lot of overhead or security issues, then, you know, patch is welcome <laughs> for the kernel config. Yep. So one last question. Uh, when do you, what is your time frame for moving this into stable? Or making it ready for widespread adoption, I guess. Like, I, I know you might not have things that. I think the only thing, I think I'm going to say the same thing we said at Google I.O., which I think was by something by end of year. So basically, an undefined thing by the end of a year. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, I don't want to get strangled by the PMs. So. Uh, Oh, another question? Uh, yeah, last question. Uh, as I mentioned before, I, uh, you know, I run Neverware, which is Chromium installable on uh, desktop PCs, and certainly the ability to use uh, you know, Linux apps has been one of the most requested features by a lot of people who wanted to use this uh, you know, in dev shops, uh, especially people who wanted to manage those machines with um, the Google Management Console. Uh, will the Management Console have any uh, permissions related to these features? Um, so from, I'm trying to remember this, uh, you, you'll definitely be able to, if you, if you run you know, the Management Console, you'll definitely be able to say you can't run VMs. So that's, that's what you say, like, oh, you know, this isn't something that should apply to a, my fleet of machines. You, you shouldn't be able to run it. So that's, that's perfectly fine. Um, I, beyond that, I, sorry, I just don't know the answer. Um, I, I know it's something being talked about, like how, how should this be managed? Possibly, you know, it's got to run this specific container image that, you know, we've locked down. Um, but uh, by, by we, I mean the, the owner of the fleet of Chromebooks. Um, but, you know, I, beyond that, I'm not certain what we have planned for that. And right now, if I compile Chromium from master, all, will all these features already be active? Um, so, so, sorry, when you say you compile Chromium or uh, Chrome OS, or Chromium OS, I mean. Cro oh, sorry, Chromium OS, if I, if I compile it from the master branch, is this already merged into the master branch? Um, so all the code is in master. It will not be enabled by default. If you are familiar with use flags, uh, you say use equals KVM underscore host. That should do it. Um, you will definitely run into some images with component updater um, because those are served um, from, from Google servers. And it won't recognize 
whatever devices, because I assume they're not Chromebooks, uh, you know, it won't download the right components, so you might have to hack around with that. Um, but there's no reason you couldn't be able to make one of those terminal images that works for your device, or just grab one of ours, download it, stick it in. They're they're general. They're they're pretty generic. Um, but they, there's like one for x86 and one for ARM. Is basically ba is basically it. <laughs> as far yeah, as terminal root. So, so as long as the kernel has kind of KVM support, it should. Cool. Yeah. Oh, and it needs to be newer than 3.18 for the kernel for the host kernel. Because right. we require VSOC and we've backported it uh, to 3.18, but it was originally not in 3.18 and it's definitely not in any earlier kernels. Yeah. Um, so that's one limitation. Cool. All right. I guess we're out of questions. Well, round of applause. Thank you so much.